Since its inception, the Apollo Theater has become synonymous with the terms legendary and iconic. It's incubated amazing talent over the years and hosted a series of historical moments. The biggest stars came out to the theater. Louis Armstrong, Bill Bojangles Robinson, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Moms Mabley, Rudy Ray Moore, Red Fox, and many others. Even more got their start at the famous amateur night, where the crowds were so brutal, they showed no one mercy. Who boos a child pursuing his dream? Amateur night at the Apollo had made a name for itself. Many aspiring artists and entertainers got their hopes up trying to make the audience happy, but their hopes were soon destroyed when they heard the sirens while they were performing. Those artists were soon joined by a wildly dressed vaudeville tap dancer who would sweep them off the stage with a broom, embarrassing the act completely. The man's name was Howard Sims, better known as Sandman, who had become a staple at the Apollo Theater and a figure that has been embedded in our culture. Not much is known about the story of Sandman, but Howard Sims' journey to the Apollo Theater is a story that you should know. Born on January 24, 1917 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, but raised in Los Angeles, Howard Sims began tap dancing at the age of three. According to Sims, he knew how to tap dance before he could walk. He went from crawling to dancing. I was born dancing. It was just a whole big dancing family. When I got up off the ground, I danced. I was just full of rhythm. I used to wear the toes out of my shoes. So my mother put steel taps on them. And that really did it. Sims picked up dancing from his father, just like his 11 brothers and sisters. Despite dancing running in the family, it didn't come easy for Sims at first, as he was considered the most uncoordinated member of the family. Sims would perfect his own style of dancing through challenges that was issued on the streets of Los Angeles. In order to challenge dancers to a duel, they would throw down their tap shoes in front of each other. Sims considered these challenges a learning opportunity to pick up new ideas. Rich children got their dance lessons at dance schools, while poor children got their dance lessons on the streets. According to Sims, he's glad he learned from the streets. Our dancing was from the soul, like what we felt, what we heard, the sound. Their dancing was from count, like one, two, three, four, five, six. In a way, it all blended in, but it was a difference in the dance. It's night and day. One night as a teenager, Sims was arrested for loitering outside of Los Angeles tap dancing school. When brought into court, he told the judge he was watching the instructor through the window so he could become a better dancer. He told the courtroom to clear everything in the room and he was allowed to dance. According to Sims, the case was dismissed after that. Although Sims enjoyed his talent, surprisingly, dancing wasn't his first priority. Before settling on that as a career, he tried his hand at boxing. However, the dream was given up after he broke his hand twice. Sims' proclivity towards dancing was reinforced after the boxing crowd liked the way he danced before he stepped into the ring. It was actually his experience with boxing that led him to getting his famous name, Sandman. I broke my hand, so I went to play around, moving my feet in the Rosen box instead. They'd rather see me in the Rosen box than in the ring. First, I glued sandpaper on my shoes and I wore my mat out. Then I glued sandpaper on the mat and wore my shoes out. Then I put loose sand in a box with a sounding board that could be miked. And on that board, I was the world's greatest sand dancer. At the time, unfortunately for Sims, his newly found trademark did not help him develop a name for himself in Los Angeles. This prompted him to move to Harlem, New York, where Sims would continue to work on his craft. As Sims was the new guy in New York, his trademark sand dancing didn't stick out as well as it did in the West Coast. A new people who danced on dinner plates, there was a man who danced on newspaper without tearing them, and another who constructed a gigantic xylophone to tap on. Sims would pick up any odd jobs he could in order to survive. Then one night he stumbled upon amateur night on Wednesdays at the famous Apollo Theater. Similar to an open mic night where comedians, musicians, dancers, singers, and other performers could try out their craft in front of an audience, Everyone speaks on how brutal the amateur night crowd can be at the Apollo. While trying out at the Apollo, whenever aspiring performers began to bomb on stage, the audience would begin to boo and the performer was shuffled off stage. The first time Sims took the stage with tap shoes, he faced the band as opposed to facing the audience and he was quickly booed off stage. Sims was booed his first few times trying out for the Apollo. However, it wasn't long before he became a local celebrity in Harlem. After being booed off stage a couple times, he eventually would win the amateur night competition a record breaking 25 times. This led to a rule that the venue enforced where performers were limited to four wins. As the 1940s were coming to a close, tap dancing began to lose its popularity with audiences. This forced them into more intimate venues. The closing of multiple spaces made showrunners to go with smaller, more intimate groups of performers instead of tap dancers who were used to perform with bigger bands. In order to compensate for the loss of many tap dancing opportunities, Sims taught dance to future stars like Gregory Hines and Ben Vereen. He also taught boxers like Sugar Ray Robinson and Muhammad Ali, which improved their own footwork in the ring. He also worked at a cafe as a carpenter and a mechanic once gigs really began to dry up. 
Sims felt that the change in music contributed to the decline of tap dancing, thinking that the tapping sound was too light for heavy beats or rock and roll that began to dominate the times. Tap had died, but we still danced on the streets. People at first thought we were kinda wacky then. In the 1950s, Sims was promoted to the theater stage manager. He would gain further recognition and eventually became an icon as the regular executor at the Apollo Theater, under the name Sandman. When audiences booed the performer on stage, Sandman would enter and rush the failing acts off stage. He wore crazy costumes, which sometimes extended to long underwear, a clown suit, even a diaper. Sandman often pulled performers out of the spotlight using a shepherd's crook, which became a staple of amateur night. The shepherd's crook had been known as the hook or the broom. When audiences would boo, they'd be unforgiving. They threw anything available, ink bottles, soda bottles, beer bottles, one got through a chair, it landed in the aisle. We cut that out. After ushering off unpopular acts, it was revealed that Sandman would console those who were rushed off stage with his own story of getting booed 10 times at the Apollo before eventually getting to finish his act to applause. Sandman's reputation did earn him gigs in Las Vegas and Canada. In addition, he performed with acts like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Lionel Hampton. However, he never became a nationally known headliner like some of his counterparts like Bill Bojangles Robinson. As tap dancing became a dying art form, Sandman formed the Hoofers, which was a six-man ensemble made to showcase tap dancing. A usual Hoofers performance would feature a solo dance from each dancer. A challenge dance-off would happen next, where they would compete against each other to see who could get the biggest reaction out of a crowd. The Hoofers performed at off-Broadway ventures and toured all over the United States and Europe. The group even made an appearance on The Tonight Show. I can dance to anything. I don't even need any music. Sometimes music can even be a hindrance. Tap dancing was mostly telling a story. A different story to each person because everybody takes it a different way. It takes a lot of skill because you have to move every muscle in your body. The dancing we do is what we feel and what we hear. You have to have a vast amount of imagination to be a hoofer. Anybody can be a tap dancer, but being a hoofer is like going over the bridge. In 1976, the Apollo Theater would close due to a rising drug problem in Harlem, along with several attendant robberies and thefts. The straw that broke the camel's back was reports of an 18-year-old being shot to death nearby. As the 80s were approaching, tap dancing experienced a revival with Sandman heading the movement. He became an unofficial ambassador of tap dance when he toured as a representative of the United States Department. Sandman was also featured in several documentaries on the genre. George T. Nirenberg's No Maps on My Taps was released in 1979, and Tap Dance in America was a 1989 PBS special. Sandman was trying to keep tap alive, and he saw me as a vehicle, George T. Nirenberg. In 1984, he received the National Heritage Fellowship, which gifted a $5,000 prize presented to the Folk Arts Program of the National Endowment for the Arts. Sandman did whatever he could to pass his knowledge and love for tap dancing to others, especially children. He also appeared in films like The Cotton Club and Tap, starring alongside Sammy Davis Jr. and Gregory Hines, his former student. In the film, his character was named Sandman as a homage to the character he created at the Apollo. In 1989, he played a crapshooter in Eddie Murphy's Harlem Nights. In 1990, Sandman's most famous role would be in the sixth season of The Cosby Show, titled Mr. Sandman. In the episode, follow Rudy's teacher telling Cliff and Claire that their daughter had not been attending dance lessons. As a response, Cliff takes Rudy to her lessons, where they meet her teacher, Mr. Sandman, of course, played by Howard Sims. This led to the iconic dance-off between Sandman and Bill Cosby. One would assume these are how the dance challenges would occur. In 1985, after extensive renovations, the Apollo Theater opened back up once again. Beginning in 1987, its showtime at the Apollo began airing at syndicated markets. Sandman continued his role on the television program, bringing his persona to a wider audience. I'm their protector, not the executioner, because that audience can be really hostile. We've had contestants panic, one jumped off stage and ran, one started fighting, or they just stand there. I can tell when they're in trouble. There's a diplomacy about it. I try to take as much attention away from them as I can. If I don't go out and get them, the audience will just give me hell. They wait outside and say, what are you doing, Sandman? Are you asleep back there? Sandman continued to appear on his showtime at the Apollo until the year 2000, where his health began to decline. He was replaced by a new comedian, C.P. Lacey. Sims died in the Bronx on May 20th, 2003, at the age of 86. Alzheimer's disease, a long-running battle with diabetes, and an ulcer would be the cause of his death. Sandman's first marriage was to a woman named Diane Sims. He married a second wife, Salon Sims, and the two had a son together. According to the New York Times, at the time of his death, he was survived by his wife, Solange, as well as his daughters, Mercedes White and Diane Jones, in addition to his son, Howard Sims Jr. According to the article, Sandman also had nine grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren. Sandman's dedication to the craft had always been noted by critics. After seeing The Sand Dancer, 
One creator left a review stating, Sims is a virtuoso among virtuosos in a class all by himself, an innovation of a traditional art. In an age where shows like The Voice, American Idol, and America's Got Talent reign supreme, is Showtime at the Apollo offered fans a familiar yet unique experience when it came to watching folks chase their dreams on television. What Howard Sandman Sims brought to the table cannot be duplicated. As he comes across our minds whenever we see a comedian, musician, or poet that needs a little bit more time to practice before stepping out in front of a live audience. Reflecting on the impact throughout his career, Sims said, I thought I was making noise all these years. Now they're calling it culture. The Apollo Theater and Sandman are culture.